So thank you all for joining and we're ready to begin the hearing. All right, thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Office of Tax Appeals. My name is Andrew Wong. I'm the lead administrative law judge who, who will be conducting the hearing for this case. On today's panel, in addition to myself, we have judges Josh Aldrich and Keith Long. Also present is our court reporter, Ms. Lynn Alonzo. Because of ongoing concerns pertaining to the coronavirus and COVID-19 and consistent with the governor's executive order N25-20, the Office of Tax Appeals has decided that it is in the public's best interest to move the June 2020 calendar to video conference hearings. We are holding these hearings by video conference with the agreement of both the taxpayer and the agency's representative. And this change will not impact the fair and objective hearing of tax appeals. This hearing is being conducted entirely electronically. All participants, including the ALJs, are video conferencing into this hearing or calling in. Should you have any problems with video conferencing during the hearing, please rejoin as soon as possible. If you're unable to rejoin the video conference, we have a backup telephone number that you can call, and you should have received that prior to this hearing. Barring any technical issues, the video conference will be live streamed to the public or is being live streamed to the public, and our court reporter, Ms. Alonzo, will transcribe the audio of the hearing. That transcript will become part of the public record. To help Ms. Alonzo make a clear record, I have four requests. Number one, please state your name every time before you speak. Number two, please speak slowly, clearly, and directly into your communication device. Number three, please do not speak over each other or interrupt when someone else is speaking. And number four, please answer verbally. Do not nod or shake your head or use nonverbal sounds like uh-huh or uh-uh. If Ms. Alonzo cannot hear, understand, or identify someone who is speaking, she has permission to interrupt the hearing at any time to get clarification. Speaking of clarification, this hearing is before the Office of Tax Appeals, also known as OTA. OTA is an independent agency separate from the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, or CDTFA. As I noted earlier, I am the lead ALJ for purposes of conducting this hearing. However, my co-panelists and I are co-equal decision makers and may ask questions of either party during the hearing at any time. Further, our panel of three ALJs will decide all the issues presented to us and each of us will have an equal vote in making those decisions. Uh, Ms. Lopez has already called the roll. Uh, when we go on the record, I will be asking each of you to identify yourselves and who you represent. So we have one issue uh, today and that is whether further adjustments are warranted to the measure of unreported taxable sales. Is that correct, Mr. Blanchard? Uh, you're muted, Mr. Blanchard. Okay. Yes, Mr. Blanchard, that is correct. Uh, this is Judge Wong, CDTFA. Is that correct, that issue statement? This is Randy Suazo. Uh, yes, that statement is correct. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, appellant has submitted proposed exhibits one through nine. Did CDTFA have any objections to those exhibits? No objections. This is Randy Suazo. Thank you. Mr. Blanchard, did you have any other documents or exhibits that you wanted to add? None of this, Mr. Blanchard, none of this time. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, just a reminder, could you please mute yourselves if you are not currently speaking uh, so we just uh, avoid the crosstalk that way? Uh, okay, CDTFA, uh, you submitted proposed exhibits A through I. Appellant, uh, Mr. Blanchard, did you have any objections to those proposed exhibits? Mr. Blanchard, no objection. Thank you. This is, uh, Judge Wong. Uh, CDTFA, did you have any other exhibits or documents that you wanted to submit? This is Randy Suazo, not at this time. Thank you. This is Judge Wong. And I just wanted to verify a Mr. Blanchard, you have no witnesses, is that correct? Mr. Blanchard, no witnesses, Judge. Thank you, this is Judge Wong. CDTFA, no witnesses, is that correct? This is Randy Suazo, no witnesses. Okay, thank you, this is Judge Wong again. 
Uh, it is anticipated that the oral hearing will take approximately uh, one hour, but 40 minutes of it devoted to parties. I have appellant's pre uh, presentation for 15 minutes, CDTFA's presentation and closing remarks, 15 minutes, and appellant's rebuttal and closing remarks, remarks 10 minutes. So appellant has 25 minutes total and CDTFA has 15 minutes total. And then I budgeted in a little bit of time in case of uh, ALJ questions and going over matters like this. All right, any final questions from the parties before we go on the record? Uh, Mr. Blanchard, any final questions? Mr. Blanchard, I have no questions. No further question, Your Honor. Thank you. This is Judge Wong, CDTFA, any final questions? This is Randy Swazo, no final questions. Thank you. Uh, Judge Aldrich, are you ready to go on the record? Judge Aldrich here, yes, I'm ready. Judge Long? This is Judge Long, yes, I'm ready. Okay, Ms. Alonzo, are you ready? Got the thumbs up, all right. We are now going on the record. We are opening the record in the appeal of Yeshatila Wuhib for the Office of Tax Appeals in OTA case number 1-8083656. Today is Wednesday, June 17th, 2020. The time is 9.14 a.m. We are holding this hearing by video conference, but the location for the record is technically Cerritos, California. I am Lead Administrative Law Judge Andrew Wong, and with me today is Judge Josh Aldrich and Judge Keith Long. We are the panel hearing and deciding this case. Individuals representing appellant or taxpayer, please identify yourselves and spell your names for the record. Mr. Blanchard. Arnold Blanchard, A-R-N-O-L-D-B-L-A-N-S-H-A-R-D. This is Judge Wong, thank you. Uh, individuals representing the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration, or CDTFA, please identify yourselves and spell your names for the record. Randy Suazo, hearing representative. Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, Suazo, S-U-A-Z-O. Jason Parker, hearing representative. J-A-S-O-N. P A R K E R. Christopher Brooks, Tax Counsel. Christopher, C H R I S T O P H E R. Brooks, B R O O K S. This is Judge Wong. Thank you. We are considering one issue today, whether further adjustments are warranted to the measure of unreported taxable sales. Appellant has identified and submitted exhibits one through nine as evidence. Appellant has no other exhibits to offer as evidence and CD TFA has no objections to them. Therefore, appellant's exhibits one through nine will be admitted into the record as evidence. CD TFA has identified and submitted exhibits A through I as evidence. CDTFA has no other exhibits to offer as evidence and appellant has no objections to them. Therefore, CDTFA's exhibits A through I will be admitted into the record as evidence. Uh, appellant has no witnesses today and CDTFA also has no witnesses. And I believe we are ready to proceed with the presentations. Um, Mr. Blanchard, please proceed. Good morning, Your Honor. Um, my name is Arnold Blanchard, and I'm representing my clients. The issue in front of you today, as stated, had to do with the calculation of taxable sales. One of the, the main issue is the sample selection that was made by the um, CDFA. Um, and the, the selection was made based upon judgment now the the the, the board um, at that time was the state board of equalization um, had um, a, a, a sample manual that indicates that for them to select a sample there must be 
a conversation with the with the with the taxpayer, um, the, the, the the my client, and there has to be an agreement on that sample selection, whether it be its statistics or just by judgment. The issue we have here, when that sample was selected, there was no conversation with me. I was part of the 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 the, the, the team on my, on my client side, and that that selection was made and a projection was made based upon those two months. Um, the state manual, sample manual further stated that um, when you made a selection, it must be representative of the population. And this is an audit standard. Whenever you do an audit, your sample selection must be representative of the population. If the sample is not representative of the population, that sample must be scrapped, throw away trash, and select another sample that is representative of the population. The main issue we have at this time, Your Honor, has to do with that sample selection. From the get-go, we inform the, I'm gonna be using the State Board of Equalization because that's what was we had at that time, if you don't mind. The State Board of Equalization, we told them once that selection was made, that that sample was outside of the normal routine process of our business. The state, the, the state board of equalization said, well, that's fine. You can go ahead and, and show us what you have to prove. We went in, we did four months of sample, randomly selected, and came back and showed the state board of equalization that the sample was totally wrong. It was far off. All of those months were within a 30 to 31 percent um, spread uh, of between the the purchase of taxable and non-taxable sales. Um, the board's selection one was 95 percent of taxable sales, and the other one was 80 percent of taxable sales. Our our selection was 60 within 60 and. 65% of taxable sales based on the purchase segregation. The board decided that they were gonna commingle both their selection and our selection. They're gonna commingle both of them and use an average. We insisted on the fact that, no, you can't do that. Your sample is out of the norm. These are the months you selected are extraordinary months that are outside the normal business of our of what we do. We did four, you did two, and we're proving to you that that's not the case. So we went into in, in circle with this. We there was there was hearing set up that was supposed to be held that was pulled up because we we there was a one of the, the judge was talking to the representative was trying to get more information from us, and they felt like yes you we're on the right track. So they pulled it. This, this case have been pulled like maybe four times, three times by the by the state, one time by us, um, we, we're ready for hearing. So the issue still continue to be that the, the the sample that was selected was way out of the norm. Furthermore, what the, what the, what the, state, what the state Board of Equalization did, they decided at one particular point that, you know what, the issue we have when they made the selection, the, the phone cards were not purchased for those two months. Okay, which our phone card is really almost of about, which is really creating the fifteen to twenty percent, fifteen percent to twenty percent of the non-taxable sales, and that's what created the problem. The state decided at that, the state board of equalization decided at one point that we should furnish them when we have the conversation that we should furnish them with the information of the phone cards that we we have. We told them we don't have all of the documentation for the phone card. We have some of them because it's been so long and that we give them a spreadsheet and they said, no, they're not gonna accept the spreadsheet. They want to see actual invoices. We went back to our client, to, the, to our vendor and request to see if they have invoices that they can give us. They gave us some of the invoices. We provided those invoices with a spreadsheet to the state board of equalization. The state board of equalization then make the decision on their own that they're just gonna exclude, since they have a total population of the phone cards, they're gonna take that out of the, the, the population and then use whatever they have as a projection to the now population that is excluded the phone, the phone card. We felt that that was not right because again, 
we are still entering on the fact that their sample that was done was incorrect. And that sample should have been scrapped in the first place. With the spread of this, 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 this discrepancy, we realized that there was a 20% swing of what is in now included in the taxable sales that my client has been assessed. Your Honor, may I state for the record that when a sales tax is issued to an individual or a company, the intent of the board of civil equalization is not to penalize that taxpayer, rather is to assist the board in collecting the sales tax. On no instance did my client collect the tax that has now been assessed on them. They never did. This sample is projecting that those tax should be paid, that my client should pay those tax because of a sample that is not representative of the population. Furthermore, I attach an exhibit, I think it's the last exhibit on, on my package, in which the, the state, the auditor, was having an issue regarding the, um, the price that we are selling our product for. And um, she came up, she sent me an email and said, um, the, the, what we have, what I did was a bit off. Can you go back and, and give us a document of what your prices are? When my client went in and went through and did all the pricing and sent it back to her, she wrote that email to me telling me that, you know, the, the prices is very low, that there's no way it will pass audit. And so therefore we should come up with something that is within the norm of the liquor store which is about whatever percentage is listed on that exhibit. We felt that we've already informed the state that our liquor store, our store is not a typical liquor store because our store doesn't sell the, the amount of liquor that normally a store of that nature would be. We sell other products. For example, we have African food product that we sell. The store, the owner of the store is an Ethiopian, is from Ethiopia. And the people that knows that she sells Ethiopian product goes there to buy Ethiopian product. And additionally, because of the, at that time, phone, um, at that time, cell phone was not as accessible as it is now in which you have all of these apps that you can use for free without having to buy a phone card. Phone card was the only avenue that people from Africa or the other country was using to communicate to their relatives back in that, in those country. And therefore, phone card was one of the typical products that was being sold in this store, one of the top products that was being sold in this store because a lot of Ethiopian uh, and, and African in that neighborhood knows that that store has those phone cards. And so that was one of the, the sources that we're bringing in, not truly the liquor that a normal liquor store will have. And so therefore, when, when I informed the auditor at that time that this is the issue, where she said, no, Unfortunately, this, my, this store is identified as a liquor store, and therefore, whatever price we give them would not pass the audit, the audit review because the store has been labeled as a typical liquor store that is that has the selling liquor, and mostly liquor store they sell at this higher level of of markup, and, and, and so that's why that exhibit is there to prove that even as we go through this process, the state of equalization they did not seem to understand that this is a unique type of store that is totally different from the normal store. Another thing that was brought up during my conversation with several different people, I've gone through maybe six different managers since this thing has been in, in process. I've gone through maybe four different auditors and three different supervisors, both in the, in the civil of organization sales tax department and also in the um, appeals department. And my position have always been the same, that your sample size, the sample that you choose is totally wrong, it's out of the standard division we're doing statistics sample, and your, your, your document, your own sample, said that it must be representative of the population. And, and every auditor will tell you whether we're doing, doing it based upon judgment, we're doing it based upon statistical sample, your sample must be represented. That's the first thing. If it's not representative, that sample cannot be used for projection because it will be a total wrong approach. I may also point out that I used to work for the state of Texas as, an, as a sales tax auditor for seven years. And I 
I, I, I did an audit in which my my sample, there was an extraordinary item in my sample that I failed to take out. And once the audit once the audit team pointed out that that particular item is an extraordinary item, I have to remove it from the population because again I realized that I was over my sample was not representative of the population that I was pulling to because that one item was really triggering my projection to be incorrect within within a two standard deviation, even though it was a judgmental sample. So, Your Honor, this is where we this is the key element we we are we are talking about here is that the sample that was selected was totally incorrect, and the board definitely refused. We've tried always to ask them to please give, remove those two samples, use our sample, the four months. We never said we don't owe money. We know we made a mistake. We said use the four months and we'll be okay. But they, they would not want to use the four months. They want to commingle to charge this higher amount of money, money that my, my client never collected. The final thing I want to bring to your notice, Your Honor, before I end and, 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 and yield my rest of time um, to you back, Your Honor, is the fact that because of the derail of the process by the State Board of Equalization, this interest have compounded humongously. Like, it is unbelievable. We just received a bill. My client just called me, I think it was on Monday, that he received a bill for 180000 of assessment for this audit. Again, I want to emphasize that the intent of the State Board of Equalization was never to, to punish the taxpayer for things that they didn't do. Rather, was it helped me to collect the tax that is due them. So for them to have this 180,000, it seems to me that, again, refusing to allow to use the right sample, it seems to me, which I don't know if that is the case, but this is just my opinion, that the other department is trying to just collect some money and assess other other taxpayer, if my client didn't have somebody like me that, that stood in to ask the question, then that assessment would have gone and my client, my client would be punished unjustly. So, you know, this audit started with about, I think the first assessment was $110,000 of assessment. And I have gone in and showed where all the errors have been. And we have limited it down to 70, I think it's 76,000, excluding the double penalty that have now, the, the interest and penalty that has been assessed on this audit. There was an agreement that the penalty will be waived totally at one of the hearing that we had. I don't know what happened to that. Uh, and again, that this is all the, the, the mix up that we've gone through through the process. So, uh, uh, Your Honor, I just wanted to point out again as I end that we truly believe that we owe some money. We're not saying that we don't owe money, but we just, our, our point is the sample size that was used by the board is not representative of my client business. And therefore, we are here to appeal that the, that sample, that two months be taken out of the, of, the projection and use the format that we have selected that is representative of the population. Thank you. This is Judge Wong. Thank you, Mr. Blanchard. I'm now going to turn to my co-panelists to see if they have any questions. Judge Aldrich, do you have any questions for the appellant? Yeah, I have a small question. Uh, so um, you mentioned that uh, the store sells African food. What kind of African food? Is it hot prepared food? Is it cold food? Is it canned food? What are we talking about here? It is cold food. It's something called taf talaf. It's like a dough that they use and they have to go cook it and mix it up and, 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 and do their own cooking. There's no cooked food in the, in the store. They don't, have the, they don't have the capacity to do that. So there's, it's, all, it's, all, it's all uncooked African food. And then are you asserting that they sold that uncooked African food uh, during the entirety of the audit? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, they did. Okay. Thank you. This is Judge Wong. Uh, Judge Long, do you have any questions for the appellant? This is Judge Long. Yes, I, I also have a, a follow-up on the questions about African food. Um, in the briefing, you noted that the African food was discontinued when the auditors arrived. Is there anything in the record to show that during the audit period, the percentage of sales should be changed based on non-taxable African food? 
I'm not black, to get your honor. No, there's nothing. We're not. We're just bringing that up to show. My, my point of making that po po point is to show that our our type of liquor store is unique to the normal liquor store. That's all we're saying. We're not adding that as an extra reduction to the to the spread because they did take into account some of those um, some of those African food. I think the month that they were looking at, yes, they had a I think the two months that they looked at there was some African food purchase made, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, one sec. This is Judge Wong. Thank you, uh, Mr. Blanchard. I also had a question. Um, so you had argued that the sampled months uh, were extraordinary. Why were they extraordinary? What was the reason for why the months were extraordinary? Honorable Blanchard, Your Honor, the spread. Can you hear me? This is Judge Wong. We can. I can hear you. Okay, thank you. I'm gonna blast it again. The the spread the, the 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 month that was purchased, there was no phone card purchase made. There was a very tiny little bit of African food purchase that was made in during those month those two months that they selected, and so therefore when they that's what caused the ninety five percent of assessment for one month and the eighty I think it was eighty three eighty four according to their month that they selected for the, the spread between purchase and non-purchase item for those two months. Just to add to that also, we went back after the fact and did a, a um, we did a, a an inventory, an ending inventory, because they were refusing to accept the ending inventory that we have because we didn't do an ending inventory. Again, you got just a little mom and pop shop. They don't have the capacity to be doing ending inventory every month. So, but they were complaining about that. So during, the, during their point in time, we decided that well, let's do an ending inventory count so that they can have it. When we did that, they said they won't, they're not going to accept that because it has, it has been far gone. The month time has, has lapsed, and therefore, they're not going to accept it. I forgot to mention another thing that was critical also. When we were doing the, the past, and I put a couple of items of that regarding theft in the store. I put a couple of exhibits there. I think it's my exhibit A or B. I can't remember which one it is now. Um, but we indicated to them that that store is highly vulnerable to theft. However, they wanted us to give them a police report. And we specifically told them that it's impossible for us to give a police report based upon where we are. If we call police on those guys, we the client is putting his life in jeopardy. And it's going to be, even they're going to come there and just blow the, blow the, blow the place off. So, but we have pictures of these individuals that were stealing items from the store. But this, again, was like just pulling a long horn on the ground, this was also not was not accepted. They said no. That normally it's only one one percent, and since you have a police a police um a police report, they're not going to accept that. So I put a couple of exhibits there also as evidence to show that again the uniqueness of this store in comparison to the normal because they were basing everything on the normal routine type of process that they had. Thank you, Mr. Blanchard. Uh, this is Judge Wong again. I, I just have one. Another question, you had mentioned that there were no phone card purchases for the months sampled by CDTFA, but it looks like in Exhibit 5, you provided uh, a chart about calling card inventory purchases from July 2008 through December 2011, and there looks like there are purchases every month, including, I think, May 2009 and April 2010, which I think is the month sampled by CDTFA. So the, in the month in the month that was selected, one of the months I have no phone card, the other month I have a phone card of $1,000. And if you look at what the purchase were for those phone cards, in an average, they were anywhere from five to seven. I can't remember again. I can't remember. I was trying to, I'm trying to pull up the information, but again, I didn't want to waste your time. So I wasn't able to pull up. I just let me comment and just do what I have to do. Um, I didn't put, I didn't pull it up. But if you look at that, if you look at that, because I have it in memory, you see that the, the, the dollar amount, the spread is really, really, really small, the two months that they selected, very, very low in comparison to our normal months. Okay, so you're saying it's not that your client did not purchase phone cards that month, but purchase lower, less phone cards than usual. For one of the month, the other month was zero. I'm 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 100 certain. One of the month we have a thousand. I think it was a thousand dollars that they have in their in their sample, and the other month was pretty much nothing. Let me see if I could. Um, oh, this is Judge Wong. Uh, 
Um, I will let you take a look at that and we'll come on your rebuttal and your closing. You could address that question again. I'll give you okay. uh, yeah. time. If, if, if there, this argon plant, if there is a, if there is a mound there, a really small amount, really, really small amount. Look at it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Blanchard. Oh, does Judge Wong again? Um, okay, CDTFA, uh, would you like to proceed with your presentation? This is Randy Suazo. The, appellant, the appellant's establishment is located in Inglewood, California. The appellant is selling beer, wine, liquor, soda, tobacco products, periodicals, sundry items, phone cards, and food. The appellant's start date was July 7, 2007. The appellant writes down daily sales from the cash register into a notebook and gives it to the CPA. The notebook sales amounts were used to prepare the sales and use tax returns. The notebook was not available for review. The department performed an audit examination for the period from July 1, 2008 through June 30, 2011. The department compared gross sales per federal income tax returns and profit and loss statements to the appellant's sales and use tax returns. Differences were noted. However, no adjustments were made. The department conducted a purchase segregation for the months of May 2009 and April 2010. The appellant disagreed with the findings in the initial segregation because they claimed that the phone cards were not included in the segregation and that phone cards made up a substantial amount of the exempt sales. In order to account for this issue, the department subtracted all phone card purchases, Exhibit G, page 209 and 210. During the audit period from the cost of goods sold, appellant reported on their federal income tax return. In addition, the department gave a 1.5% allowance to address supply items that may have been commingled into the appellant's federal income tax returns cost of goods sold amounts. Exhibit G, page 154. The two-month purchase segregation resulted in a taxable purchase percentage of 86%. Exhibit G, page 193, which was applied to the adjusted cost of goods sold to obtain the amount of taxable purchases for the applicable periods. A comparison of audited taxable purchases to reported taxable sales for periods from 2008 through 2010 showed negative markups for each year and an overall markup of negative 19.49% for taxable, product, taxable products. Exhibit G, page 204. Due to the negative markup, the markup audit method was used to compute audited taxable measure. Once the taxable cost of goods sold amounts were established, the department made an adjustment for taxable self-consumption based on estimates provided by the appellant. Exhibit G, page 202 and 203. The department also granted an appellant a 3% pilferage allowance after Appellant claimed that theft was a problem for their establishment. Using the two-month purchase segregation, the department established weights for various taxable categories, beer, wine, liquor, carbonated drinks, taxable products, periodicals, and sundry items. The department then performed a shelf test on the aforementioned taxable categories and applied markups computed for each category to the appropriate weighted purchases to arrive at a weighted taxable markup. The appellant did not agree with the selling prices obtained by the auditor and performed their own shelf test on the same items. The department took prices from both the department's test and the appellant's test and averaged them out for each item in the wine, liquor, tobacco, periodical, and sundry, uh, sundry categories and computed markups for each, computed markups for those categories. Exhibit G, pages 167 to 177. The department, however, did not average the markup for beer and carbonated drinks because the appellant seemingly applied an arbitrary 10 to 15 percent markup on item selling, on item selling price per, uh, per, on item selling price prior to CRB inclusion. For this reason, the department used the markup established solely by the auditor's shelf test. For beer markup, an adjustment was made 
for beer sold in packs versus single sales concerning some bottle versus can sales, as the appellant had claimed that the ratio of single selling prices are too high. This is on exhibit G, page 156 to 166. For carbonated drinks, only single sales are accounted for, as no case sales or displays of cases for sale, of pack, for sale were in the store. The department further reduced the markups for each category by 1%, to make up for any time lag when the shelf test conducted, when the shelf test conducted against the purchase invoices uh, they were applied to. The computed markups for each category were applied to weights established from the purchase segregation to establish an overall markup of 35.06%, which was accepted as reasonable for this industry. Exhibit G, page 155. The markup factor of 1.3506 was then applied to the audited cost of purchases to arrive at audited taxable sales. The audited taxable sales were then compared to reported taxable sales and differences were noted. For 2008, the percentage of error was 52.57%. For 2009, the percentage of error was 51.65%. For 2010, the percentage of error was 81.81%. And the overall percentage of error was 60.84%. Exhibit G, page 153. The percentage of errors were then applied to the reported taxable sales for appropriate periods for January 2011 through June 2011 period. The overall percentage of error was applied. During the audit process, the appellant had conducted their own four month purchase segregation. Exhibit G, pages 195 to 201. The periods that they chose were December 2008, September 2009, March 2010, and June 2011. An analysis segregation disclosed that when the four months are annualized and compared to the average yearly purchases for 2010 to, for 2008 to 2010, the purchases are understated by almost 40% of what is expected. The two-month audit purchase segregation was within 9% of what is expected using the same analysis. This is on exhibit G, page 189. Review of the appellant's purchase segregation discloses that the purchasing pattern of beer vendors appears to be incomplete. Historically, beer vendors are on a weekly purchasing cycle. Exhibit G, page 195 to 201. The purchase segregation conducted by the appellant's representative does not show the same weekly cycle that the auditor's segregation showed. The missing purchase purchases distorts the taxable weights and the taxable to non-taxable percentage, thereby invalidating the appellant's purchase segregation to be used in the audit in the audited results. In addition, the department reviewed an inventory count a third party performed on June 21st, 2012, and found that over 95% of the inventory listed was of a taxable nature. This is on the 836A, Exhibit G, page 134. Uh, Analysis of exempt sales is closed the following. Purchases of phone cards for 2009 and 2010 equaled $151,233. This is on Exhibit G, page 209. Review of, of the appellant's exhibits shows a 40.46% markup on phone cards when using the face value of the cards as the selling price to the cost. This is from the taxpayers provided exhibits page three or exhibit three, page four, and exhibit six, page eight. When applying this markup factor, the phone card sales project out to 212,421. Reported exempt sales of $885,465 were reported for the same year period. When the projected phone card sales are removed, food sales are $673,044. Based on the audited food purchases of $76,259 for 2009 and $78,675 for 2010 for a combined amount of 154934 this is on Exhibit G, page 204, the gross profit on food would be $518,110, and the markup of the food would be 334%. The 334% is not reasonable is not a reasonable markup for, the, for these items in this industry. The appellant has not provided any substantive documentation to support change to the audit findings. Therefore, the department requests that the appeal be denied. This concludes my, my uh, presentation. I am available to answer any questions you may have. 
This is Judge Wong. Thank you, Mr. Suazo. Uh, Judge Aldrich, do you have any questions for CDTFA? Uh, not at this time. Thank you. This is Judge Wong again. Judge Long, do you have any questions for CDTFA? This is Judge Long. I do not have any questions. Thank you. Uh, okay, so now we will turn to appellant, Mr. Blanchard, Blanchard again, for your rebuttal and closing remarks. You have 10 minutes. Please proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Honor Blanchard here. Um, I think the state has not been truthful in what they've said. They have gumbled up a lot of things. I, I sit here and wonder why that is the case. I mean, as an auditor, as a CPA, honesty, ethics is one of the fundamental things that we have to bring into factor when we discuss items. I would, let's start with the first untruthfulness that's been put, produced here by the state. It seems like the, 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 what they're saying is that at the beginning of the audit, they choose the two months and that two months was taken and then, no, that's not true. They did a projection based upon the two months and they assessed our stacks based upon the two months. We went in and did our own four months and proved to them that the two months is not representative of the population. And I think this is where the whole discord is. All the mathematical, Jogging that's been said here is just to confuse people. The 52% fit one and all of those numbers being thrown into this is the untruthfulness of the state to confuse an ordinary person who doesn't know exactly what they're talking about. Let me let me start by what say. If you already if you have a population and you decide to take a chunk of the population of the population out, of course your percentage are all going to be higher. Because <laughs> your base is smaller. That's just mathematics. That's simple mathematics. And so what the state have done, they took away all of the phone cards that we purchased, took it out of the population, and they now use the base, a smaller base population, to that higher percentage that they have from the, from the two months. It's not going to work. That's why you have all of, all of the projection that they have given is based upon this mathematical error by taking out all of the phone cards out of the population. A simple example would be if you already have a finding that is 60% of based upon the population and the population, your sample base only have $1,000 of phone cards, and then you decide to take that $1,000 out of the, of the phone card and use that base, the percentage is going to be higher, number one, and then the projection to this other base is going to be higher. So this mathematical and, and that they're showing is really just to confuse an ordinary person as to what the facts are. The fact is very simple in this case. There is a sample selected by the state that is totally wrong. It is not within the normal business of my client. They decided that they're going to stick to that, that they're going to use that sample. When we started, they blended it. Now he said that the, 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 it was indicated here that they, they didn't use the formats. Again, that is the, that is the false, pre false information. They did use the total six month blended. Bef now I didn't even I, I wasn't even aware that they took the four months out. This is news to my ears that they did took the four months out and were only using the two months as the projection. Because that was never discussed in all through the process that we went through. Every single one of those process, it was a blended between the two and the four. But the presentation today seems to suggest that it's only the two months that we used. Again. If that is the case, this is something new to me. I wasn't aware of that. Um, and, and then in terms of this weekly projection between the phone cards and, and those other things that they're talking about, and use, again, it's based upon the mathematical. When, whenever you're doing projection and sample, you're, you're going to have, I could take a, a population of things and I could give you a projection of, of numbers, but it's based upon the data that I'm using. If the data in the first place is faulty, at the end of the day, the results will be faulty. And so that's that's the key element here. The data was faulty from the get-go. The state definitely refused. We pleaded, we showed them evidence. They definitely refused to use the right data to do the projection. And so of course, the projection is all gonna be all the things that they've stated here. Again, Your Honor, I have nothing else to say, but I, like I said before, that sample of the two months should not be accepted 
because it was out of the normal projection that that would normally have in our business and 95 percent and 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 by the way they stated that it was 85 percent and it started off about the about the purchase segregation no the purchase segregation came after the fact the for the 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 the, no, the price the price um the cost of price came after the fact the fundamental issue was the purchase segregation that was used it was indicated that we didn't have the records for them to look at that is not true either. We have the book. The notebook was there that we have to show that what the sales were um, that were there. And, and, and by the way, one thing that has to be pointed out: our federal tax return, which is what we report to the to the to the federal, and that of the sales tax, there was an indication that there was some there was some change, there were some differences, but no adjustment was made. I would like to know why no adjustment was made because normally in the audit manual, that's the first thing they do. They compare what, what our sale is to the federal tax to make sure that what we report in the federal tax is the same as what our sale is. If there was a discrepancy between the two, why was there no adjustment made? Because again, what we're getting at, what was sold was reported. What was sold was reported. Our sales on the sales tax was the same as on the first, and this was also stated that there was no, we have no error on the sales side because the amount, the gross sale that was reported on the Fed, on the sales side was the same, was almost identical to what was reported on the federal tax returns. So I'm not understanding because of projection, there's an indication that, okay, we made a mistake on both report, both on the sales side and the federal tax, and then the state decided to come up with this higher amount of, 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 of sales that we have, which you go look at the, the store, the numbers that they're projecting, it's impossible for that store to sell that volume of sales. You're talking about them talking about all of these numbers that they're showing here about giving all this negative percentage, 350 percentage. Again, this is using false indicators to do projections because the indication will be false because the data that you're using is incorrect. And so that is, we never faltered on the fact that the sales match each other, so you can tell us that we underreported our sales when we, you, the, the states in the written document said the sales were, what was reported was, was not a problem. It was more of the, the spread between the the, 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 the taxable and non-taxable. So I, I, I'm a bit confused having this presentation be made and given all of these numbers and all of these projections that seems to be so unrealistic in the type of business that we do. Again, if you're using a normal liquor store as the benchmark, for our liquor store, definitely, you're gonna have all these numbers of negative. Secondly, if you're using a data that is totally wrong, mathematically, if the data is wrong, the result is wrong. And we have been on the position from the get-go, the data that was used by the state is totally incorrect. Because again, that was not representative. So anything else they do, of course, they're gonna have results that will point to something that is so um, outrageous. Because again, the data from the get-go is one that is not even correct. Thank you, Anna. This is Judge Wong. Thank you, Mr. Blanchard. Uh, I'll turn to my panelists one final time for any questions. Judge Aldrich, do you have any questions? This is Judge Aldrich. Uh, you have a question for the appellant's representative. Um, regarding thefts, how much theft was occurring on a monthly or daily basis? Uh, I, I'm not. I wouldn't be able to give you exactly what that. If I do that, I'll be. I will be giving you false information here. And like I said before, my ethics comes before anything. I don't have that. I don't have that information. But what they were, what we, what they were projecting. I think when we talked to it was a four percent for that for that particular test. They gave us three point five. And I think we, we were okay with that. I brought that up just to tell you how much struggle we've gone through the process. Yes, I cannot be able to give you fully that information that you're asking. Thank you. I don't have any further questions. This is Judge Long. Judge Long, do you have any final questions? This is Judge Long. Thank you. I don't have any questions. Okay. Thank you. This concludes the hearing. The record is closed and the case is submitted today. The judges will meet and decide the case based on the exhibits presented and admitted as evidence. We will send both parties our written decision no later than 100, today, 100 days from today. The hearing is now adjourned. The next hearing will begin in approximately 15 minutes. I'd like to thank both parties and their representatives. Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.